So um, I have to say, with the um, uh, shootings this week and the Dallas shootings, I have to say I was actually uh, really kind of gloomy and uh, depressed because it just seems that we seem to be a violent nation. Now, technically, statistically, that's actually less true, but that's the way it feels to me, so I want to share my opinion. And I have to admit, my opinion is not always right, but I always feel that it is. And my opinion is this. Um, there's this idea of the myth of redemptive violence. And what the myth of redemptive violence is, is this. That if you offend me in any possible way, then I have the right to use overwhelming anger or rage or violence against you. And that's the myth of redemptive violence. You see it in, no offense, the Islamic terrorists, that if you draw a picture of you know, the Prophet Muhammad, they have the right to use overwhelming anger and violence against you. And my problem is that this is not just the Islamic terrorists. This is actually part of the culture of the United States. Look at all the movies, most popular movies, that if offended, you use overwhelming violence against your enemies. Doesn't matter if it's really cartoons to Tarzan to whatever. That's part of the American uh, social media. And even among kindergartens, there's a rise in violent behavior. And so, of kindergarten, the fastest growing group who's getting really um, pharmaceutical drugs to calm them down is toddlers. And it's crazy. And the problem is we live in a, a society where for entertainment and video games you get to use overwhelming violence. Um, that's the myth of redemptive violence. Um, I just think it's part of the United States and it's part of our problem. So the mentally and uh, psychologically weak among us they especially fall for this. And the opposite of that, 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 by the way, was the myth of the pagans. If you look at how pagans believed the world was created, the world was created because two gods got into a fight and you know, you used the body of the other gods to create the world. And it's a pagan's way of saying the world is just inherently evil and violent. The opposite of that was actually the book of Genesis. Where in the book of Genesis, when God creates the world, it, the world is not created uh, because of some aftermath of a war. The world was created because God simply created it out of great love. And so the book of Genesis is that no human beings were created out of great love. It's our fallen nature that chooses violence. But we are created for love. And I mention that because uh, I really do believe with the shootings and all uh, this stuff, the real answer is love. And when people are holding up signs that, you know, the answer is love, I believe it. But even my problem with that is that real love, it takes a lot of work. It is the simple answer, but it demands a lot of work. True love demands loyalty and patience and courage and self-discipline. Um, that's the gifts of the Holy Spirit. That's what a society needs to work on if we're really going to become loving. It is the simple answer, but it takes a great amount of effort. And with the myth of redemption, with rage, you suddenly feel powerful. Rage is easy, and it makes you feel powerful. Love demands a lot of work. And yet, I think that's the right answer. And so, the readings this Sunday kind of speak to this very same thing. Look at the first reading from Deuteronomy. Moses, it's his farewell speech. He's know he's, he's going to go. And he pleads with the people where it's a great speech where he says, you know what the right thing to do is. You know, it's, it's right on the tip of your tongue. You know the answer. It's written in your heart. You know the answer. You just have to do it. And that's the hard part. You have to choose it. And most people really don't. And so the book of Deuteronomy, it means second law, they came up with all these rules and regulations to make sure we were pointed 
at love. That's actually the, the first law is the Ten Commandments. The second one is really um, all these hundreds of rules and regulations that are in the book of Deuteronomy and Leviticus. And they're not rules for rules sake. They're actually um, the most common word in the book of Deuteronomy is the word heart. And the idea is that these hundreds of rules were created so that your heart is always pointed towards love. I have to admit, I love that. Uh, that was the purpose of all these rules and regulations. But the problem is, over the centuries, people started to use these religious rules and regulations not to point their heart towards love, but as an excuse to really not love or do the right thing. And I know that sounds crazy, but that happens. And that's what Jesus' parable about the Good Samaritan is. It's about somebody who you know the right thing to do, but you come up with some religious teaching not to do the loving thing. And religion does that all the time. That's actually the point of the Good Samaritan. And, like, there was this priest once, and um, I got in an argument with him, with him. It was 23 years ago, and yes, I remember. It was 23 years ago. I'm Irish. Do you know what Irish Alzheimer's is? You forget everything but your grudges. So, <laughs> it's not a good trait, but I will remember my arguments. And the problem is, I don't dislike this priest, but to be honest, he's lazy. And if you ever need somebody to visit you in the hospital or need help, he will not be the person that helps you. He loves being a priest, doesn't like doing the work. Um, and he irritates me because he, never, he always finds a religious excuse not to love. And so once the Good Samaritan parable was brought up, and he says, well, what a lot of people don't understand is that the priest in the story, he couldn't help the Good Samaritan, or the, sorry, the, the Jew that is half dead, because there are rules in the book of uh, Deuteronomy that forbid it. And I mean, I knew this, and I said, you are absolutely right. The priest, if he's going to, he's on his way to Jerusalem to pray, and if he touches a dead body, then he wouldn't be able to go into the temple and pray. You're right. The guy was half dead, but if the priest cared to open his eyes, he would have seen that the guy was still half alive. He had a moral obligation to nurse him back to health. He chose to see that he was only, the guy was half dead. He chose to use religious rules to get out of the obligation to love. And so the priest kind of backed off because I was so angry. But I find that so common among religious people. They'll find some obscure part in the Bible or some teaching of the church so that it gives them excuse not to really choose love. And that's what the Levite is doing too. The Levite is the theological uh, the professional theologian. They're ones who make sure you observe the law. And the Levite, if he touches the man, if he touches blood, then he won't be able to give his lecture, which means it's going to cost him as well. Um, he wouldn't be able to earn his wage. So he walks to the other side of the street, the side of the street and lets the guy die. Once again, he's using religious rules that are designed to make sure your heart points towards God to get out of love. And the other thing you find is the victim himself. If you really read the story, what's going on is, and excuse my language, the guy's an idiot. He is. Because, number one, he's a bigot and he's an idiot. He's a bigot because uh, faithful Jews, they didn't like the Samaritans. So when they were going to Jerusalem, they would walk clear around the Samaritan area and they'd come in from Jericho. Um, so right then, it tells you, if he's, the way he's chosen cut to come to Jerusalem, he's a bigot against Samaritans. And he's an idiot because he's traveling the wrong time of the day. That road, uh, the Jericho road, um, it was known as the bloody road because if you're traveling on the wrong time of the day, it's filled with bandits. You are going to get mugged and beaten up. It's 
kind of like here in the United States, you know, there's some parts of the United States that are very dangerous. You don't want to be caught there after dark. And you know what I'm talking about, Star Idaho. Um, <laughs> no, those people are crazy. When the sun goes down, you don't want to be trapped with those people. Um, you know, there's just some places that are dangerous. And you're an idiot if you get caught in the wrong time of the day. So the guy clearly is a bigot and an idiot. And you can blame the victim. And you can blame the victim to get out of your obligation to love. Um, that's the point of that. But lo and behold, it's the Samaritan. And the Samaritans are, they're half Jewish, but they're kind of heretics. Um, the Samaritan who has the wrong theology, you know, he's the one who does what needs to be done. Goes back to Moses. You know the answer. This is not a question of theology. It's on your lips. It's written in your heart. The answer is love. And the, you just have to choose it. And that's what the Samaritan does. The priest, his problem is, yes, he wants to go to Jerusalem and pray, but if you pray, it's supposed to open up your eyes so that you can see the victim. The Levite, the theologian, you know, yes, he's good at observing the law, but you're sub you observe the law so that really you can see the victim. Um, people do this all the time. They use religion to get out of the obligation to love. And in the book of uh, the Gospel of Luke, that's why Jesus is constantly, and he does this. We're just not aware of it because we don't know those little tiny rules. He's always breaking these rules for the sake of love. Jesus is the good Samaritan. Um, he's always doing this to other people. And um, the other part I like in the, the Gospel of Luke is in the Gospel of Luke, when you show love, it's always connected with the theme of healing. The Samaritan shows the Jew love and offers him healing. And my point being is that really if we're going to heal our nation, we have to choose love, which also means choosing patience and self-discipline and courage and loyalty. But that's what's going to heal our nation. And at the very end of the gospel, Jesus says this, right? The lawyer, he asked the question, what is the greatest commandment? And as Moses says, you know the answer. And he gets it right. But he's looking for a loophole. Well, who's my neighbor? Um, you know who your neighbor is. And so Jesus tells the parable, and then he ends it this way. And he says, do this and you will live. There's very few places Jesus says, do this and you will live. It's on the commandment to love and the Eucharist. In the same way, like, you can't celebrate the Eucharist alone. Not even a priest is technically allowed to celebrate the Eucharist alone. You have to celebrate it in community. Do this and you will live. And the same thing with love. You need a community that's committed to it. And my point being is this. Um, I have no wisdom to teach you. I'm really not that smart. I'm, I know nothing. I know less than nothing. I have really nothing to teach you. But as a great philosopher said, most of the important things of life you don't need to be educated on. You just need to be reminded. And so as a community, we come back week after week to celebrate the Eucharist so that we're always reminded what needs to be done. We already know the answer. And it's love. Our prayer, our prayer, our observance, it's all supposed to point our hearts into the direction of love. We just need to be reminded. And so, looking at the uh, Dallas shootings and the shooting in the United States, I think part of the problem in the United States is people are believing in the myth of redemptive violence, that they have a right to hate. We gather week after week after week here, really to remind ourselves that you have a choice, and you already know the answer. As Moses said, you have a choice. You can either choose the myth of redemptive violence that you have a right to hate. And let me go off on this tangent, too. The priest and the Levite in the parable, when religious people choose not to do, choose love, if they choose not to do that and walk on the other side of the street, to me, that's a form of violence. 
you're just too cowardice to say that you hate. It's just a way of politely allowing violence into the world. Um, we gather week after week, really to choose one of two ways, either the way of violence or the gospel of love. But as Moses said, you already know the answer. You just have to do it. And so together, let us stand.